Good morning, everybody, and welcome to GenX Power's Q3 Investor Update. I'm Craig Sainsbury, who helps GenX with their investor relations. Today, we've got Simon Kidston, who is a director of GenX, James Harding, who is CEO, and Craig Francis, who's CEO, to talk you through their Q3 results. So with that, oh, and before I hand over to Simon, um, please use the Q&A facility or the chat facility at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. There will be a Q&A um, session at the end of the presentation. So Simon, with that, I'll hand over to you. Um, thank you very much, Craig, and good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's a pleasure here to present what I think has been a really strong quarterly result. And in a moment, um, James Harding will step through the operational details and Craig Francis will talk through the numbers. Um, of course, people familiar with GenX will know our flagship project up in North Queensland. Um, this is a, what I consider to be a beautiful image of the project, but it's now rapidly being transformed into a renewable energy hub. Um, just summarising the portfolio very quickly, um, we've got a billion dollars of capital invested into renewable energy assets. Of course, the investments centred in North Queensland at the former Kidston Gold Mine, comprising the operating solar farm, the pump hydro, well and truly under construction, um, a wind farm, which we'll, we're very excited about. We'll give an update on that in a moment. And um, of course, we've just financed our Baldwin Battery project near Rockhampton, which um, really provides an exciting step up in our earnings from next year. And, and finally, the Gemalong asset, which, um, as we'll discuss in a moment, has performed really strongly in the last quarter. Of course, everything we do has got a clean green lens. Um, of course, the contribution of this portfolio into emissions reduction is truly significant. Um, some 2 million tonnes of CO2 abatement by 2025 when these assets are fully operational, equivalent to 350,000 households. So significant on a national scale and may I dare say even on an international context. Hand over to, to James Harding, CEO, for some operational updates. Yeah, thanks very much, Simon, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, delighted to be here uh, joining this results presentation today. As Simon said, it's been a really strong quarter um, for GenX, and our two operating solar farms in particular have been performing very well. Um, really pleased to note that we've had positive cash flow from operations this quarter. Craig's going to provide you some details in a moment. But this is due to the excellent technical performance, both of the Kidston Solar and the Gemlong Solar Farms uh, in Queensland and New South Wales, respectively. They're both amongst the top five performing solar farms uh, on the NEM. Um, and we're also seeing very strong pricing on the market, particularly in New South Wales. Uh, the LGC prices we've seen you know, reaching almost $50. That's well above forecast. Um, and black prices have been, again, extremely strong in the last quarter. And there's some reasons for that. Um, in particular, it's um, the um, uh, problems associated with coal-fired power plant. There's been some, some failures of coal-fired power plant on the NEM. Uh, the availability of those uh, power stations uh, is down, and we expect that sort of to continue over time as these, uh, these assets age. Um, and the future curves are also showing you know, very strong increasing prices across uh, particularly New South Wales, but other parts of the NEM. Uh, and that's due to the forecast closures of uh, coal-fired power plants, particularly Liddell and more recently Araring Energy. So that's just going to increase pressure uh, on pricing and, and provide uh, a basis for more renewables to enter the NEM. Um, so, yeah, Craig will provide sort of details of the figures of those uh, strong cash flows from the two solar farms. Uh, I'll just finish this slide with um, just a short discussion on the, the Kidston Hydro project. Um, I was up there uh, this week, uh, delighted to see the progress on construction. Um, we're very much on schedule uh, to complete uh, construction and, and commission the project by the end of 2024. Uh, lots of works going on um, above ground and below ground, and I'll provide some more detail in following slides. And finally, the Bouldercombe Battery Project, uh, which we reached financial close beginning of this year. Uh, that's now kicked off. Uh, we've secured the supply slots from Tesla. Uh, they're now completing the design. Uh, and the balance of plant contractor, CPP, uh, is also completing the civil and electrical design and preparing to mobilise on site uh, in July this year. So we're expecting to have first generation of power from that battery in the middle of 2023. 
I'll hand over to Craig to talk about, about the numbers on the next slide. Thanks, James, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so the total generation uh, figures for the quarter were 66,000 megawatt hours, and year to date, that's 180,000 megawatt hours. Um, that is down on the P50 expectations, but um, we're really pleased with the outcome given the weather events that have been facing the east coast of Australia this summer. Um, it, it, it's been a very wet summer and that has affected generation. Um, pleasingly though, the revenue figures are certainly ahead of our expectations, $6.4 million for the quarter. That's comprised of $2.8 million for KS1 and $3.5 million for Gemalong. Gemalong, that's an average bundled price of $105 a megawatt hour. As James said, we're, we're really actually quite pleased to see the LDC pricing uh, remaining strong and, and we have seen that trending upwards of late and, and we're selling LGCs at the moment sort of around near $50, which uh, we never thought we'd be, be saying 12 months ago, but um, that's fantastic to see. Year-to-date revenue is uh, $16.4 million um, and we're expecting that to, to, to get to, to the $21 million mark for uh, the full year. Cash receipts, um, as, as we've sort of explained in past uh, presentations, these lag um, the revenue results due to the sort of one month settlement uh, period. $7.8 million uh, for the quarter and $18.5 million year to date. And a strong net cash position um, as at 31 March of $62.4 million, reflecting uh, the proceeds of the recent capital raising, um, the SPP and the, and the placement, $47 million in total. Um, and then and the contributions we've made to the construction programs for Baldicum, um, as well as the cash inflows we've received in the solar farms. A very key metric that James mentioned is, um, is, is we are operating cash flow positive this quarter of $1.7 million and year to date, um, you know, still operating positive, cash flow positive uh, to the tune of $500,000. We're expecting that we shall finish the financial year um, operating cash flow positive uh, for the first time in the company's history. And that's really reflective of the full year contribution of Gemalong. Um, you know, those, those two solar farms now really um, generating enough cash to, to cover the, the sort of running costs of the business and, and, and the farms themselves. So a uh, really strong quarter and um, you know, we're really pleased with, with how the, the plants have performed. What we're seeing with Gemalong and, and the pricing is while generation has been down, the pricing is, um, is, is providing a natural hedge. Um, you know, when there's weather affecting solar output in New South Wales, that, that does lift prices. And by having an exposure to the merchant pricing, uh, we are seeing a, a natural hedge across the portfolio. And that's where the revenue figures are um, surpassing our expectations. Finally, just to, just to finish on this slide, um, a very important metric for us is uh, that for the, the quarter and for the year, there's been zero um, lost time injuries and environmental incidents particular focus of ours given uh, the activity that's going on at Kidston with the, the $800 million construction project um, up there with the hydro. I'll just move on to um, talk a little bit about the, the battery project and, and just recapping because we've, we've discussed this quite a lot um, in recent months, but the Baldwin Battery Project, it's our first battery project. It's 50 megawatts, 100 megawatt hours, and it's located um, near Rockhampton in central Queensland. Uh, we reached financial close on the project in February, so a very key milestone this quarter. And that's a $59 million capex project, which will be funded $35 million with a fixed interest loan with InfraDebt and $24 million of equity, which was provided by way of that capital raising. So it's fully funded. Mm -hmm. Importantly, uh, the, the loan with InfraDebt fixed interest rates for 13 and a half years. And we're very pleased to have done that at, at the time we did, given uh, what's been happening in, in the global um, and, and local um, interest markets. Um, we're, we're certainly um, seeing a lot of upper pressure on yield curves, but fortunately we're very insulated uh, from that with the fixed interest loan within Fredette. Just recapping, the, uh, the, the battery itself will be sourced from Tesla via a supply agreement, which we, we locked in in September last year, again, um, prior to, to the commodity price increases that we're seeing in the market uh, presently. So, so very pleased to have secured that. Um, and Tesla is also providing a 20-year O&M arrangement and warranty for the, for the battery cells and an eight-year offtake, which I'll talk, talk to briefly on the next slide. Construction is underway and uh, we're expecting this um, plant to, to start generating in uh, the second half of year 23. Just recapping on the offtake structure, um, 
It is an eight-year offtake with Tesla. It gives us the guaranteed revenue floor. Um, and, and Tesla will operate the battery to uh, maximise revenue across the energy market arbitrage and FCAS markets. They, they guarantee a floor and then we share in the upside um, beyond that floor in accordance with a fixed profit share ratio. Um, this, this project, as we said, um, it, it's, it's scheduled to be delivering what we expect to be $15 million of revenue per annum uh, in the second half of calendar year 23, so we should start to see that contribution in FY24. I'll hand back to James to talk through uh, the hydro project, which he uh, recently returned from. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yes, I was very, very pleased to be up at site this week at, at Kidston, and uh, we're now a year into uh, the three and a half year build of the project, and it's really exciting to see what's what's happening at site. Um, so the pictures you see there uh, are of the main access tunnel. Uh, we announced start of construction of that main access tunnel uh, back in January this year. Um, and just for those who are not aware, on the schematic uh, picture there, it's the purple spiralling tunnel that goes down one and a half kilometres from the surface down to the underground powerhouse, which is the grey building underground. Um, and you can see the two uh, water intake vertical shafts in, in white from the upper reservoir. Water will drop down 250 metres into the powerhouse through the turbines, uh, generating power and out through those yellow more or less horizontal tail race tunnels into the lower reservoir. And the process is reversed uh, as uh, water is pumped back through the through the pumps, the reversible pump turbines, and back up into the upper reservoir uh, to store. So, uh, yeah, it's very exciting to see the progress. I was down in the tunnel yesterday. We're, we're well over 300 metres in, over 15% of the access tunnels complete. Uh, you can see on the right-hand picture there the portal uh, opening of the access tunnel, uh, and the sort of middle picture shows the uh, the face of the tunnel as it's being drilled. Uh, it's a drill and blast operation, um, and between four, four and a half, four and four and a half meters uh, is is blasted each uh, each shift, and uh, and uh, yeah, progress is continuous. Uh, the other uh, exciting news this month is that we've uh, kicked off construction of the Wise's Dam. Uh, that is a six kilometer uh, circumference. 20 meter high elevated dam that's being constructed from the existing rock waste from the mine uh, to create that uh, that upper reservoir across the Wises Dam. Uh, and there's lots of activity there, um, earth moving um, going on on site uh, to construct that dam. Uh, later this year, we'll see the start of equipment from Andritz Hydro of Austria arriving on site. The embedded parts will, will arrive by the end of this year, and we'll see obviously the main turbine generator equipment arriving during the course of next year. Uh, and then in 2024, we'll see completion of the, the power line, uh, start of commissioning and commercial operations by the end of that year. So just on the next slide, just to get, sort of give a bit of a reminder of the scale of the project, um, the Kitchen Hydro project is our flagship. It's a $777 million uh, investment. Uh, close to 85% of that cost is funded by federal government agencies, the NAIF, uh, with a $610 million long-term concessional fixed rate loan. Importantly, it's, it's a concessional loan that's, that's fixed for the term uh, and a $47 million grant from ARENA. Um, and there's a significant contribution also from Queensland government for the long transmission line that will link Kidston to the, to the NEM. Uh, we're operating under a fixed, uh, fixed price full wrap lump sum EPC contract with two of the leading contractors, McConnell Dow and John Holland, uh, and uh, they're, as I say, they're well, well progressed and well underway with construction. Uh, when it's built, it will be uh, a 250 megawatt, 2000 megawatt hour uh, storage device. It'll be the third largest electricity storage device in Australia. Uh, and it is the first pump hydro project uh, to be built in 40 years. And uh, I was happy to be escorting uh, two Queensland ministers. We can move to the next slide, actually, Simon. Um, because we were able to obviously uh, show uh, the Minister for Energy and the Minister for Resources uh, the progress of repurposing the old gold mine uh, to, uh, to a pumped hydro project and, and so they could see for themselves the state of construction. But we were also able to talk about our Kidston Wind project, which is our next uh, pipeline development, uh, where we've identified a very strong wind resource just to the south of Kidston. Uh, and that 
will be developed over the next couple of years. So it will connect into the new transmission line that's being constructed for primarily the hydro. Uh, so we see very, very strong engagement again for Queensland uh, government uh, for completion of what is going to be the, Ki the Kidston Clean Energy Hub, which will comprise solar, pumped hydro and wind when it's complete. Uh, that project we're developing together with J Power, our strategic partners, on a 50-50 basis. They're providing most of the development funding for the project, um, and we are now well progressed in our uh, final feasibility. And we're engaging with uh, suppliers and wind turbine suppliers and contractors, uh, and with uh, offtake partners um, this quarter. Uh, and we expect to progress those during the course of this year, and looking to close the financing. Um, in the second half of 2023, which will allow the project to construct and connect into that new transmission line in 2025. I'll hand over back to Simon just to, to wrap up. Thank, thanks, James. Um, what, one thing I think that's becoming increasingly apparent is that this business has scale and it's diversified. But one thing I think we need to articulate better to the market is the fact that we've got embedded locked in earnings growth and of course as craig described earlier we've got a very strong platform now with two operating solar farms um, we'll do re we'll do record revenue this financial year i think we'll exceed 20 million dollars based on the performance we've seen recently which really sets the company up well to go to the next level and in terms of that next level having now financed the Baldwin project um, we'll see a step up substantially in revenues um, commencing mid-2023. So I think this business has got scale, it's got embedded earnings growth, and of course that's all before we get the substantial contribution from our pump hydro project. It's strategic, it's significant, and it's going to really turbocharge the company's revenues and earnings, which I think is something which will dawn on the market as we get closer to reaching that milestone of commissioning the Pump Hydro project during the course of calendar year 2024. The wind project is looking really good as James described. And, um, and that of course is the next leg of the company's growth as we grow out this portfolio. So look, I guess in summary, um, we've always had a laser-like focus on delivering projects on time and on budget. We did that successfully for the first two operating solar farms. So far we're delivering that in terms of the timelines and delivery of the pump hydro project, and we'll absolutely apply those same principles for the delivery of the battery project. All of that will mean that the company is on its way to delivering uh, long-term, highly contracted revenues, um, approaching $90 million by 20, well, once the pump hydro has been operation, and of course, all being done under very, very, um, very strong EBITDA margins, some 76% of the revenue falls to the bottom line due to those highly contracted nature of those cash flows. So it's a billion dollar business, it's diversified, it has scale, and we've got locked in earnings as we deliver these projects. Um, one, one concluding comment I will make, um, the market of course is very, very focused on the impact of inflation and potentially interest rates. One thing we've been meticulous about is locking in our interest rates at each time we finance a project. And this is important because we've got high levels of certainty as to our funding costs and the blended average of our um, interest obligations are around 3%. Given where interest rates are at the moment, I think that's a significant feature, which will no doubt become um, very, very important as interest rates move into this um, increasing interest rate cycle. So the company's hedged, we're protected, in many ways, as a strong asset of the company, having locked in that funding at very, very low concessional rates. So, so with that concluding comment, um, Craig Sainsbury, I'll hand back to you. Simon, um, and James and Craig, just reminded for everybody um, to use the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen, uh, and I can read the questions out. Um, first one for you, um, when are, are the operator agreements for both Kidston and Gemalong up for renewal? Uh, and if so, when would they be up for renewal? Uh, so we have long-term uh, O&M agreements uh, in place for both those projects. Um, we actually appointed uh, Solar Rig as the O&M contractor uh, for Kidston last year. So that will be up for renewal 
um, in four years' time. And Gem Long, similarly, that is a, a, a long-term five-year agreement with Beyond, who are the EPC contractor that constructed it, and that has another four years to run. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that there was some very strong pricing coming through um, over the last couple of months, particularly in New South Wales. Um, the question here is the cash flow from Gemalong expected to, to continue to rise in the short to medium term um, with those high wholesale electricity prices, in particular um, relating to some of the coal price increases and unit retirements at the Liddell Power Plant. I'm happy to take this one. Um, so our view is that um, certainly in the last 12 months, the the wholesale price curve for New South Wales and, and, and including LGCs um, has risen significantly, and and that is a result of um, these earlier earlier sort of coal retirements um, and and the, the the lower reliability of coal plant. The fact that there's plant being taken out of action um, every summer. Um, continuously um, is really impacting on, on the coal generation coming in during the day, and which which then um, in turn um, increases the, the the price at which we're, we're receiving for Gemalong. So absolutely, we do think the pricing is going to remain strong, and and um, you know we think there's going to be more coal closure announcements coming over the um, short to medium term. In terms of the next quarter, um, Gemalong's irradiance is is seasonal as as to be expected. And um, it's it's much more seasonal than KS one, so we we think the generation will, will be lower um, just due to to entering the winter months and the shorter days. Um, however, we are buoyed by the the strong pricing and particularly the strong LGC pricing that we're seeing. So we think it's going to be another solid quarter um, next quarter. Thanks, Craig. Um, probably follow up question there. Um, move to operational cash flow positive this quarter, which is positive. Some really good prices <laughs> coming through. Um, in the solar, what's the opportunity to expand um, either Gemalong or Kiston Solar, like a Brownfield expansion opportunities for those solar farms? Um, yeah, look, I'll take that. So there, there are opportunities. We're, we're, we're looking, we've got plentiful opportunity. In fact, we have a project up at Kidston um, that is in feasibility phase for you know, a potentially quite large uh, additional solar capability up at Kidston, and that's uh, we're, we're progressing that at the moment, noting that... Um, you know, there, it is cyclical, and uh, as Craig said, there are months of the year that we do see still some negative pricing in Queensland. That's that's underpinned the business case for our storage strategy in Queensland. So we're certainly looking at that carefully uh, at um, uh, at Gemalong. Uh, that is on also on the distribution network. So uh, there are limitations as to how much capacity we can put at that location. But we're certainly looking at other opportunities in New South Wales. We see, yeah, strong strong pricing for renewables. Uh, solar and wind in, in New South Wales. Um, question then on solar versus wind. You know, mentioned opportunities for solar up in Queensland. You've got the K3 wind project. Been building out a diversified renewable energy business. Um, what are the, I guess, return differentials between solar and, and wind and allocation of capital? Would you be sending that to, to wind versus solar? Just a bit of a, a, a thought, through, thought process through that. Yeah, look, I'll, um, I'll I'll tackle that, and uh, Craig, you can jump in if you have something to add. But uh, yeah, they obviously have different profiles clearly, um, and yeah, we've seen such a prevalence in Queensland of new, of uh, solar, both rooftop residential solar and large scale utility solar, uh, and obviously that solar farms generate during the day when when the sun is shining, so it's, they're all coming on at the same time. Wind obviously has a different attribute; it depends where uh, it's located as to yeah when. You know, what time of the day the strong is is uh, the wind is blowing strongest. So, um, if you have uh, wind located you know across the NEM from North Queensland down to South Australia, yeah, you'll get a pretty good spread of uh, wind blowing at different times of the day. So, um, certainly at times when when prices are high in the evening peak, for example, you sometimes see some pretty pretty strong performances from from wind in particular. And we see that at Kiston, uh, the Kiston wind profile uh, matches very closely to the demand. Um, profile in Queensland. So that's been quite attractive to off-takers and the discussions that we have. Um, so this all factors into our, you know, what we see is a, a, a portfolio approach for GenX. We want to have a combination of wind and solar and balancing storage in our portfolio, which allows us to um, take take benefit from you know, high pricing, uh, either by generating uh, you know, wind in, in the evening peak or being able to move solar into those peak periods. Yeah. Um 
a few questions around the, the storage in particular, the, the battery strategy. Obviously, you've got Baldicombe there. You've mentioned before um, potential other projects. Is there some updates you can give to the market on um, where potentially you're looking and, and what may be there beyond um, Baldicombe from that energy or the battery storage solutions? Yeah, so we are, um, I think we sort of mentioned previously, we're certainly looking to extend our, our storage capability and that's predominantly battery, although I would say that we're you know, keen to, and we are looking closely at other opportunities for pumped hydro very selectively, um, but we've uh, created quite a bit of a sort of expertise and experience in developing pumped hydro and we see a real place for deep storage as well. But in the sort of short, medium term, uh, battery storage, probably larger uh, batteries than what we see at Baldicombe, but probably in the range of two to 300 megawatts for between two and four hours. Um, and we're looking um, across Queensland in particular, we see a particular strong business case to capture arbitrage revenues alongside the FCAS revenues in Queensland, and, and that's likely to continue. Um, so we're looking at sites in uh, across the state. Um, Baldicombe's obviously strategically located in the centre of, of Queensland between the the, the strong loads uh, to the to the east and south, uh, and the renewable energy resources to the north. Um, so we're looking uh, equally in sort of further north and North Queensland, and and in the sort of southeast part of the of the state where there's strong strong demand. So I could see that we'll have you know one or two further big battery projects in Queensland, uh, probably across the state in those areas. Thanks. One on Baldicum. Um, when do you anticipate that being or well, that generating cash flow for the business? I guess timing for energisation, for want of a better word. So yeah, it should be energising in mid next year. So we're seeing revenue starting to flow from the third quarter of next calendar year, twenty twenty three. Um, a few questions just coming back to um, solar and, and the pricing that's been received. Um, how sustainable are the higher LGC prices um, at the moment? And I guess what's the delta in earnings of the company from base case and those higher LGC prices? I'm, I'm happy to take that one, James. Um, so I guess the LGC market, is it's peculiar. We've seen um, sort of from the second half of last year, last calendar year, um, Real, real sort of resurgence in LGC pricing, and it's really been driven by C and I um, market participants acquiring LGCs to meet their green um, requirements rather than their obligations under the um, the renewable energy target. Um, more, more to meet their green credentials, and so there's been more demand than supply in the market, which is is keeping the pricing um, high. And I guess that the thematic there is is in our view going to continue. Uh, I don't think that's going to go away as, as we move toward um, you know, the net zero by 2050 commitment that has been made by uh, the federal government. Um, so, so we do think that it will be um, will remain strong over the, the coming uh, years. However, our forward curves are all based on um, your reduce, reduce pricing and, and fading out uh, by 2030. So um, that, that's the view we take, but we think that's a very conservative view and there is certainly a lot of upside um, to, to that that view, but certainly in the next um, you know two three four years, we're, we're expecting prices to be um, above thirty dollars. Yeah, and when we refer to CNI, we're actually talking about major Australian corporates and industry groups. So essentially, um, most Australian companies are seeking to switch their energy supply from fossil fuel source to a component which relies on clean green energy. So that's why a business like us, which can, ply, can supply the energy, is well-placed, I think, over the next um, you know, period, next 10 years or so. Thanks, Alvin. Um, just a reminder, just use that Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen to, to pop any questions in. Um, next question um, for James and Craig, I think this one here. Can you drill down a little bit more, please, into the revenue components uh, for the quarter between Kist and Stola with the government top up with there and also Gemalong. Yeah, happy to. Um, so Kids and Solar, as we know, it's under a, um, a PPA with the Queensland government. Um, that PPA provides for a, a price floor, but not a price ceiling. Um, so the revenue received is based on the um, generation for the period without um, adjusting for MLF or anything. Um, 
and 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 the, the PPA price being applied. There was um, a, you know over, over the, the life of the over the full quarter, um, there was top up payments received, um, and that's factored into those revenue numbers of two point eight million dollars for the quarter. However, we did see some really positive pricing in a couple of months, which really reduced those top up payments um, to close to zero. So um, it was it was quite a good quarter for um, for us and for Queensland government as well. Um, for Gemalong, as we've said, um, we are selling all of the generation 100% into the wholesale spot market. Uh, so we'll receive the black energy price and we then acquit our LGCs on a monthly basis into the spot market. Again, uh, we sell them through a broker, typically a bilateral to the major um, retailers and, and, and market participants. So um, that number there, $33.5 million, um, equates to all of the generation for the period, 33,465 megawatt hours, giving an average price of 105 megawatt hours. Uh, sorry, one hundred and five dollars uh, a megawatt hour. Thanks. Um, expected life of the Kingston pumped hydro project, please. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll take that one. So these are very long lifed assets. Um, you know, the all the underground construction, the tunneling, uh, underground uh, spaces will be uh, designed for over a hundred year life, um, and we talk in terms of an, an eighty year uh, life for the pumped hydro project clearly the uh, mechanical electrical equipment the key pump turbine equipment uh, will be operated and maintained under a long-term contract by andritz hydro which is the technology supplier of that equipment uh, and there is provision for obviously some replacement of parts uh, along that uh, period uh, but the bulk of expenditure on sort of replacement of sort of uh, replacement capex uh, occurs after after year 20 and that's all uh, allocated within the within the project budget Thanks. Um, Simon, I think you mentioned that um, there was fixed debt with InfraDebt. Um, can you just provide a few comments around the, the NAIF debt that's been used to fund the development of the Kingston project? Yeah, look, I, I will, Craig, but just um, finishing off um, a comment in terms of our long life assets. Um, for us, a short project, a short term project is the Baldock and Battery project, which has a warranted life of 20 years, solar farms for 30 years and pump hydro 80. So I think that underpins the fact that this business, it's long life assets, it's um, its core energy infrastructure, which, um, you know, which is really significant in a national context. In terms of the funding, um, that blended interest rate I referred to of 3% is significant. We've hedged our interest costs. We do so at financial close. And, and that enables, of course, um, the majority of our cash flows to fall through to the bottom line. So that's important, I think, especially now as the market is in a, um, a rising interest rate environment, which could last for, for, for quite a few years into the future. So this business, we're hedged, we're locked in, and it's a really important point, I think, the market hasn't yet fully grasped. Alan, uh, another question on, um, I guess, longer-term funding, but when all these assets are up live and running and generating cash flow for the business... What do you see as the optimal funding and capital structure for the company looking like? Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. Um, so typically we have sought to reduce the reliance on equity by project financing our projects. And we have quite a high level of gearing across the portfolio, um, but we have uh, required equity to, to finance um, you know, our major capital investments. Um, we, uh, uh, the view has been, and we've communicated this before, that uh, when the hydro comes online in um, calendar year 2024, the company will be generating significant cash flows and be uh, fully cash flow positive um, and, and be in a position to um, you know, consider where that cash is applied, whether it's reinvested into the portfolio growth or, um, or, or returned to shareholders via a dividend. In the meantime, um, without having completed the capital raising um, in February and March, um, we have now a really solid working capital position, which we think is, is going to get us through to uh, the, the contribution from the Volcom Battery project, and that, and that should um, in turn get us through to the completion of the, the hydro project. Um, so we, we don't um, foresee any short-term um, capital requirements for the operation of the business. We are, as, as we've, we've talked about, um, looking to expand the portfolio during the, the construction phase of, of Bolicum and the Hydro project. Um, however, we are very conscious of preserving that working capital um, and, and so we'll be looking to do so through a partnership 
arrangements uh, with third parties and similar manner to what we've done with the wind project and, and with J-Power. So we'll hopefully have more to say on that um, over the balance of uh, this calendar year. Great. Um, we've talked a little bit about inflation. Um, do the PPA offtakes have an inflation adjustment in them or are they a fixed price? I can answer that. Um, it's so, so it's a mix. Um, if some of them are in nominal dollars. Um, case one is in nominal dollars. Um, however, importantly, the hydro has, a, has an indexation factor um, applied to it, so it will rise with, um, with inflation. Great. Well, great, Simon. That's all the questions for today. Um, Simon, I think I'll hand back to you for, for any closing remarks. Look, I think we've, um, you know, the, the intention here is to have these webinars on a quarterly basis. We'll time them at the conclusion of or following the announcement of our quarterly results. So pleased to have delivered on this latest quarter and we look forward to updating everyone on what we've achieved in the following quarter. So thank you very much, everyone.